Welcome to Trinity Radio. I'm Jonathan Pritchett, and today I have Miguel Benitez, a dear friend of mine, a fellow Biolian graduate, uh, Eagle. Um, yeah. Right? Yeah. We are the yes. Eagle. Eagles. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure I didn't get that wrong. <laughs> oh, wait. Um, but we were at Biola at the same time. He is now Instructor of Humanities at the State College of Florida. Miguel, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, thanks so much for having me on. Oh, it, it, long overdue. And then we need to get you on uh, with both me and Braxton on other topics. But th today we're going to be talking about education. But you have to issue uh, what our friends at secular universities always have to say. So go ahead and say it. Yeah. So basically any opinions that I um, share on this program are my own and are in no way representing uh, any institution that I work for. See, I love those kind of statements because technically I should probably say that Trinity uh, Radio and whatever I say is not to be reflected on right. Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, except that's not true right. because they will hold it against me. <laughs> Braxton will storm into yeah. my office if this goes, you know, when this goes sure. up. And if I say something crazy, he's going right. to... There's an accountability you, you, there. Yeah, yeah. You know, you represent not just yourself, but you represent our seminary. Yeah. And while well, speaking for myself, yeah, but you work here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sure. so I mean, how do you navigate that? And, and that is, that's a fine line we have to walk, right? Because in yeah. some sense, I am representing the college and um, whatever academic work I accomplish, they certainly uh, want to, uh, you know, have their name on on that academic right. work <laughs> but uh but yeah when we get into certain issues um i just need to clarify that uh i'm in no way representing the position that my institution holds so, i understand yeah. and and because you went to biola that that and you're currently an all but dissertation uh, doctoral candidate at um faulkner university getting right. the degree uh, uh um doctor of philosophy and humanities That's right. um a degree that uh I have been eyeballing for myself just for fun. Um, plus Braxton went and got a second doctorate. So, you know, uh, I got to keep up with the Braxtons. And, <laughs> and so, but no, I'm so jealous of that yeah. degree because you're a, a big fan of philosophy, which is your specialization in the humanities, right. but, but just great literature in general, the canon of great books and all of that. You've kind of, uh, dove off that I my dad was you know a, a layperson accountant but um, he was an avid reader and um, my uncle was a salesman for Britannica so my mom made her husband my dad uh, help her brother out yeah and so we ended up with with, with the the original 54 volume set and right. uh, starting about uh, the age of 15, I was in 10th grade and we got assigned uh, the Iliad. And instead of buying my copy, I saw that we had it on there. And I started reading and I think I finished around 22 when I was 22. Read through it. Uh, bits and pieces got spotty where I left it. And, you sure. know, but, but uh, overall, I'm glad I, I was able to plow through that. Uh, some of it's better than others. Now you... Right. Uh, um, you have a YouTube channel, so why don't you tell everyone about your YouTube channel that doesn't get videos often enough? And <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, I basically I do have a YouTube channel. You can find it at Miguel Benitez Jr. Um, and um, yeah, basically what I try and do is I, I post videos, though infrequently, admittedly. I hope that once the dissertation process is over. Uh, this is something I can I can contribute to a bit more, um, and it's it's kind of a combination of things. Um, when some people write interesting books um, that are usually in conversation with the great books, uh, or at least some of the topics uh, that the great books will tackle, I will post the interview there. Um, I also will sometimes uh, cut clips from some of the lectures that I record for my own college classes, and I'll put them there, and then also. Um, I try and engage with some of the great books from time to time, and I'll post summaries, analysis, kind of dive into some of the questions that that are raised in those works. Yeah, and I want to encourage people to uh, click the subscribe button on Miguel Benitez Jr.'s, uh, that's the name of the YouTube channel, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very original. <laughs> Uh, go subscribe because the, and go watch his back catalog because it's fantastic stuff. Uh, and I've been a, 
uh, I've been telling him always post your videos in like the Trinity radio forum and other places. Um, so I've, I finally learned how to use some YouTube. So I'm a subscriber and I'll see the little dot that lets me know there's a new video. There never is, but um, great stuff. We were, we were checking out your uh, Euthyphro dilemma yeah. video, which has a gazillion views. And I'm like, they, right. just, they need to subscribe <laughs> to the channel. Don't just watch the video. Right. And yeah. you need to say like, and subscribe. Yeah. A hundred different I'm times. terrible at, uh, you know, self promotion. Yes. And you shouldn't yeah. be because you're awesome. And I, I, and that's why I'm having you on. And so those of you who are friends of mine that haven't been on yet, you're not as awesome. So, Miguel, uh, recently Braxton and I were talking about homeschooling, but yes. that was that's one little bit. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to education, when it comes to Christian education. Right. Um, you have worked, uh, you're at a uh, university now or State College of Florida, but you have worked in private Christian education as well, right? Yeah, so um, I went to K through 12 in a public school. Um, okay. I did my um basically i started coaching football at the high school i graduated from as soon as i graduated and so they had me as a permanent sub i would come in often um and and substitute teach for them did some of my student um student teaching at um a secular uh, school or at a public school um and then yes i have taught at uh private christian schools i have taught for uh, co-ops and hybrid programs um, that that are kind of school two days a week and then uh, the the kids kind of do their work from home the other days of the week um, and then I've taught for full online Christian programs as well for I still technically consider them homeschooled students but they're really basically doing Christian school online so it's design curriculum that's commercially available to homeschool parents to incorporate into their own uh, material that they're teaching their kids per grade level or something. That's like right. That. In some cases, it was kind of an a la carte. These courses are being offered by instructors and parents could kind of pick and choose what they wanted. Um, in one of the other programs that I worked that was local, it was face to face, not online. Um, you pretty much bought into the whole curriculum and it was two days a week. Uh, where we would teach. That, and that's then, the co-op. Yes, it was more yeah. of a co-op. Yeah. Yeah. Things that Braxton and I never volunteered to do, but should have. <laughs> so yeah. now, uh, are, do you homeschool your children? Yeah. So we have just started. This past year was our first year. Uh, we did pre-K four with our son. Um, and so now we are doing kindergarten with our son and uh, pre-K three with our daughter. So okay. we do. And now a lot of parents are finding themselves in this situation. I know that some schools have opened up, but others either have not, or they're giving parents the choice to, you know, send your kid in a face mask right. uh, or and, and not touch anybody or talk to anybody or sit and eat with anybody at lunch or just, just go with your face mask on, shut up and, and get indoctrinated. Or No, I'm just kidding. We love public school. So, no, we don't, uh, or I don't, but no, public schools, uh, we live in a world now, we were kind of talking about this before, it's almost a dystopian future come to yes. the present. Um, these uh, weird um, Antifa people built a guillotine outside of Jeff Bezos's house, I don't know if you saw that, and then the Chicago Teachers Union retweets it and says, we're for this. Yeah. That's yeah. a... By the way, teachers unions uh, in Chicago, they represent the, the collective uh, of public school teachers in that area. Uh, and most teachers are uh, public school teachers. They do belong to teachers unions. Right. Um, right. Which are wicked. But um, and I'm, I'm I don't mind unions. I'm not an anti-union right. guy, but teachers. I mean, when you're championing guillotines outside of sure. uh, people's houses, that's not a good look yeah. for teachers. Right. Um, and, and, and in in defense of some of the teachers that maybe belong to that union, we are in a system that basically um, it's the it's the way it functions. Right. You you don't have a voice unless it's the union speaking for you. And so uh, it's it's everything becomes negotiation. And so everything is about the union and the administration. I, and so yeah. I'm sympathetic to 
the yeah, actual no, teachers that end have to up, put in, up with in it. this yeah. situation. They, they get yeah. trapped in a yeah. hostile system yes. uh, that's, yeah. that doesn't benefit them as much as it, it probably that's could. Right. doesn't that's benefit right. them as much as other unions benefit uh, their members. Right. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of unions for people that are in various um, construction. And things yeah. like that. Right, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they do good work, you know. Yeah. Electricians have unions and so forth. But teachers unions, and they don't, by the way, have a, I, I looked, and I don't recall seeing a disclaimer on the union page saying we don't, the views represented from this <laughs> god-awful Twitter account don't right. necessarily represent the views of all teachers in Chicago. So maybe you, the yeah. union members should organize and say, hey, we're not about guillotines. So maybe not that some, but anyway, but it, that, it, that is a very extreme example of, yeah. that, that is a symptom of a problem that we find in public education. Right. And the public education, um, it, parents see all the time in their social media feeds that they want to teach uh, to, you know, second grade kids, how to masturbate and all this weird, crazy stuff. And, and, yeah. and, and all this exploitative uh, sexuality in a time where pedophilia and sex trafficking of children is on the increase. But yet this is the, instead of math and science, <laughs> this is what we see in our feeds. So how does that happen? Yeah, you know? no, that, 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 that's great question and great point. And, and I want to just kind of give this, I want to preface what I'm going to say by saying this. Um, there are certain circumstances that are beyond our control. And so I want to acknowledge that people may find themselves in different situations, sending their kids to public school for different situations. Yes. And so nothing I say is an attempt to shame that person, right? Um, so I, I've had this talk with my wife. She knows how passionate I am about education, how passionate I am about Christian education. And I remember sitting down with her one day and just letting her know, because I wanted to make sure this was never a burden to her. I said, if I die and you're left alone raising our kids, you send them to public school and teach them to love Jesus. Like that, that you know, you, you do whatever you've got to do to make it work. Also, public schools oftentimes have much better uh, resources or facilities for students who have special needs. Right. So um, a lot of Christian places don't have a nurse that they have on staff um, or don't have, you know, uh, certain trained professionals for certain disabilities. So mm -hmm. so I want to acknowledge the complexities um, for some people of deciding what the best educational route is um, for your children. But I will say, how does this happen? Um, I, I think it happens when a couple of things. One, we live in a culture of skepticism. We can't know anything. And so what are we left with? We're left with our feelings. And so we feel like this is what should happen. And so there is no meaningful dialogue about what should happen. It's just how we feel. And, and, and you should feel a certain way. You should feel like us, otherwise you're bad. Um, and, and, and so we're not having meaningful dialogue about these things. Um, and, and so I think that's a big hindrance. Um, I also think it happens when we think that education is completely neutral, right? So there's a sense in which we can talk about doing math. There's a sense in which we can talk about, you know, uh, grammar or whatever, um, and, and get away with it for a while. Um, but then you have, you know, a PhD candidate in math posting on Twitter that, well, two plus two doesn't always equal five. Um, yeah, that's fine if, if, if you want to play that game, but we know that you don't mean two as two in that case, right? You start equivocating on what two means and then you can make it something else. And so, um, so, so I think that when we think, when we assume that education is neutral, um, we now take certain assumptions for granted and then begin to build off of that. Um, and, and so science, for example, that's how we fall into scientism. The idea that science is the only way we can know something for sure. Right. Something that I see in a lot of my students now at the college level. Well, where have they I'm teaching first and second year college students. Where have they learned this, right? And it's, they've been told by our, by our culture, by our society, that science is the way we come to know things. Think about philosophically, 
how many things you have to have in place before science even gets off the ground. Right. Right. But we're not talking about those things anymore. And so we've taken them for granted. So once you start removing these things, um, you now have room to, to kind of bring in, sneak in some different ideologies and things like that, because we're not asking basic questions. We're not asking, wait, how did we get there? We've kind of smuggled everything in. We, we, don't, we don't have to account for the things that we you know, believe. And, and so it really becomes almost education by force. Like this is what society says. And so we need to indoctrinate in this way. And our kids notice. So my son, just a few weeks ago, he was watching a show and it occurred to him. He said, hey, how come in the show that I watch, every time they go to school, they never talk about God? Right? Mm. My five-year-old is saying he associates school with learning about God and what God has made. And he's seeing them at school and it seemed odd to him that there was no mention of God whatsoever. So even the, you know, my five-year-old son notices that there's something different about what they're calling school and what we're doing as school. Sure. And what's interesting about when you, when you talk about, um, we, we have... A, a society that has kind of kicked out the philosophical foundations, these yes. pillars that, that props something like science up. Right. Um, we, so on, the, on the one hand, we have people running around who demand um, that science be the only valid means of acquiring knowledge. And on the other hand, they, they say that men who pretend to be women are really women. Uh, so right. where does science go there? And, and of course, um, reason, logic, and critical thinking, all foundations for science, things that they used to actually t tell us back when I was in a public school. I don't know if they still say that, um, but now logic is bad and the sign of white supremacy or something right. like that. And, and uh, of course, I am the white guy in this video. And so, um, but you're probably, you're the philosopher. So you, you probably know logic and reason better than me, even though you're my token minority for the week. How about that? Right. Yeah. Um, so, but I mean, you, you've heard, you've heard these, and this is coming from more of your colleagues than mine because you're in secular education right. and you're seeing these math PhDs and, and all of this stuff. Now grammar, if you, if, if you, uh, right uh, in, a, in a you know professional academic way that's all of a sudden bad uh, we're getting all of these things and of course all of my minority friends are maybe because because I live in a bubble they, they're like this is all stupid sure. and and of course it's mostly woke white lesbians that are peddling this nonsense but um, yeah this is this this kind of worldview confusion where I mean what you feel is your truth, except science is the only valid means of time. those two things are diametrically opposed to each other, but somebody can hold those ideas simultaneously now in their minds, and that I think is the worst product of our education in this country is that you can think that those two things are compatible that you can have your truth independent of you know, what we think of correspondence, that which corresponds to reality. Uh, but at the same time, science is the only way to acquire knowledge. And you can have both of those ideas that, that everything is relative uh, and you can't know anything, but you can only know things through science, even though you can't know anything. Yeah, um, you're right. And, and I, think, I think more than anything, um, what, what worries me is that the, the space for even having the discussion is being eaten up right? To, to even ask foundational questions like, how did we get here? Um, or wait a second, you're asking me to believe what? And, and, and can you please kind of demonstrate to me why this is something we should hold to be true? There's no space for even having that discussion. Um, and, and, and so at that point, um, you know, uh, inquiry and, and, reasoning are limited because you're not allowed to go into certain spaces. Mm. Interestingly, kind of the criticism that oftentimes gets leveled at religion, right? If, well, if you hold to religion, then you're, you're ruling out certain conclusions when you're doing your work. Um, when in fact, what we've seen now is that the religion of secularism um, has now imposed those boundaries um, 
and so you're not even allowed to probe. You're not allowed to ask those questions. Um, this whole idea of like cancel culture has really made for some strange allies, right? Yeah, I mean, you hmm. see people who are uh, very liberal in their politics, um, very liberal in their theology, and yet they're saying, hold up, this is, this is going way too far. Uh, so for example, JK Rowling, I don't know if you heard about that whole situation, but um, the author of Harry Potter, uh, she made some comments and people really didn't like them. She has never come across as this kind of um, super conservative. Um, she does say that she's a Christian, but even her theology seems to be a bit more liberal. Um, but she said something she didn't like, and people were calling for canceling J.K. Rowling. Like, mm. um, it, it, we don't even want to have the discussion anymore. And I think that's really problematic. Yeah, because I think what you're referring to is some, some comments about uh, the trans community, right? And, Correct. And, and stating something that's, uh, if we were going to go to what science tells us, seemed to be a pretty accurate statement. Uh, just going by right. science, you know. And, and the thing is that J.K. Rowling herself, at least as best I can tell, is typically supportive of the LGBTQ right. community. But it was like she she kind of stepped out of bounds and 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 it all came crashing down yeah and 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 so when people like that aren't safe you know no one is safe right uh, certainly right. not guys like us because I mean, correct but, but we're our but as christians we're already going to be hated for his sake and we should yeah. and and when you speak and sound like a christian you, you're gonna irritate people sure. and 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 it used to be don't be more offensive because uh, the gospel is offensive enough, but that th those kind of slogans from '90s or even early 2000s evangelicalism don't apply anymore. Because anything you say from a biblical perspective, somebody is going to be outraged, and if, even if the outrage is totally phony and it's fake indignation, and they're just grandstanding and all that, you still have to deal with it. That's right. You know, whether it's in your Facebook feed or whether it's at a coffee shop or whatever, you're still getting all of this. And, and again, all of that comes back to the way people have been educated. And, and we, in apologetics, you will recall, they were sounding the alarms about public education and, and, and uh, or not public not just public education, but, but public universities, like the ones that you work at, where Correct. they're going to go to, they're going to go and, you know, they're going to go to these schools and they're going to leave the faith. Right. Um, and, 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 but now it's, 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 um, shifted to to where in our public school systems now they're already getting all of this anti-christian worldview stuff flung into their their minds um and so my my wife homeschools and i i'm the pe in bible guy but that's about all i'm good for uh she's got the uh real degree in in uh, accounting so she mm -hmm. knows real things um you know theology and apologetics that's not that's real world, your wheelhouse right yeah, yeah but it's not like i mean i get fired and i go flip burgers <laughs> right <know>? right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> she, she yeah. can she'll have to go back to corporate america but right um same with you, man. I mean, that's kind of how it is in academia. Mm -hmm. If you become a professor, that's great. But if you're not a professor, um, at least you have something that's still useful in, in secondary education. I don't. Right, right. <laughs> so, sure. so, so, you know, but, but barring all that, uh, and, and our, they're getting educated in, in and indoctrinated in a bad way. I mean, indoctrination is just a neutral word What in, in the sense I'm using it, but they're getting indoctrinated in a bad way with things that are hostile to traditional Christianity. And my wife has talked to a lot of these parents that are switching to homeschool because of the way the public schools have handled the COVID thing. Sure. And so they're like, well, if I got to do this, and there's teachers in Tennessee saying, don't watch what I teach your kids even. Right. Um, they're like, okay, we're done. Uh, and, and we'll make it because, because, um, I understand the single parent, you know, yes. we wanted to say that, that, uh, that we hope that your wife doesn't end up being because you right. die, <laughs> right. at, at least not during this recording. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> Get no. through the show. Right. Get through the <laughs> <laughs> no, we we don't want that to happen. Right, but but right. there are there but some people are are single parents for other reasons as yes, well. Um yes. uh and they 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 can't uh, 
you know, it's just or, not feasible. Yeah. It's just it's not just, feasible. Yeah. Um, actually, I think it is. Uh, and well, and I know a little bit about what right? it, yes, and I want to get to that. Yeah. And I want to get yeah. to that soon. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're, they're abandoning uh, the public school system. They're like, yeah. okay, we're just going to do this. Um, especially in two parent homes. Uh, right. I found that that's more common. It's harder for right. single parents. It is. Um, but uh, I, that's good. But you, in addition to having experience with co-ops and, and, and that, your private school, not all private education and homeschool education is created equal. Correct. But you are a believer in what's called the trivium, at least at the early stages. And, yes. And, and I don't know if you're into the uh, beyond the quadrivium. that. Yeah. Quadrivium. Yeah. Um, but, and, and, and great books literature being core part of the, curriculum do you is that still you still wave the flag for for that kind of uh, what we'll call classically classical education or classical christian education right yeah classical education you know and and different schools will define that differently but yeah basically um for me the most important elements of what we would call classical education are the seven liberal arts uh the trivium being grammar logic and rhetoric and then the quadrivium being astronomy, arithmetic, geometry, and music. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think that that's basically the idea behind the liberal arts education, that word liberal, um, not having the political connotations right. of today, but being tied to the word liberty. It's this is the education that you need for a free society. Right. Um, and so this is kind of day one in my humanities course. Um, we have emphasized STEM, right? And, and the seven liberal arts account for that, the quadrivium, but we've emphasized STEM at the expense of the humanities. So what we've done is teach people to do their job, but in this society where we're supposed to play a part in our governing and we're supposed to play a part at the polls, we should be taught to think and we should be taught to think critically and rationally and carefully and, and know a little bit about political philosophy and know a little bit about history. And, and those things, that's why a liberal arts education was so important for so long, because this only was given to the class that was the ruling class. They were the ones that had access to the liberal arts education. We live in a society where for a while, we kind of pushed towards giving everybody a liberal arts education. And now ironically, as we're pushing for more equality and more justice, our education system is saying, just teach people what they need for work. Um, And and I wanna be clear here, I don't think everybody needs to go to college, especially in the kind of certain system that we've set up now. But like when you talk about your dad, and I've heard you talk about your dad before, um, being, an avid reader, um, you know, buying the great book set, like you want a classical education, do that. Like this is not to suggest some kind of elitism. This is no. not everybody has to go get their PhD. This is just, you know, engaging in the most important questions that we deal with as human beings. And, and that seems to be at the heart of a classical education. There's other things that people get caught up in, learning Latin, learning Greek. Um, those are great and, and do that if you can, but th- that's not, at least in my estimation, kind of the core of that. The core is engaging in the ideas of Western civilization that's that right. have developed through time. And what, right. what, what uh, it has been come to be termed as the great conversation that we're yes. all supposed to participate in ironically like you said not only are we training people for for just work instead of a whole life or what leland reichen would say the whole soul right you know we're we're training people for work and we're trying to shut down conversation and we're calling all the old dialogue you know just um you know that's either a symptom of white supremacy which even uh oh i uh, what is his name he he was a he was a liberal film critic in um in New York, who went back to Columbia to, to revisit the great books courses that he took there. I, uh, his name escapes me. I have his book back there, but so many books, right? But anyway, he wrote, it's like this whole dead white man thing. It's crazy. You haven't, number one, they're not all dead. I mean, they're not all dead white guys. They're, they're, right. they're uh, you know, you, 
I don't know why Augustine gets thrown in as a right. dead white guy. Yeah, I'm, I, I I'm don't either. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, or, um, you know, uh, what what is his name? He wrote, um, he wrote, uh, uh, oh, what is that? The one, um, ah, I'm sorry, Miguel. My brain is shutting down okay. on me. No I, see, what happened is I had Mexican food. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for lunch and uh i ate i always get full on chips and salsa and then all of a sudden i get my meal and i ate that too um but but yeah uh my my dad why am i having a blank here my dad's favorite movie is based on his book the man from la mancha right um uh <laughs> what is the name of that book come on don quixote um um Anyway, out. not a, not a dead white guy either. Right, right, sure. But but yeah. So, but anyway, you get. But even they don't want to have the great conversation anymore. Right. Like you right. need to stop talking unless you, unless you pedal the code of you know contemporary. Um, I, I don't uh, le leftist ideals, I guess, um, which yeah. is strangely fascist, even though they're saying they're not fascist. Um, but it's it's just weird stuff, and. And like you were talking about earlier about, about um, these pillars, these philosophical foundations that underwrite things like science. Well, I mean, right. the, the, the kind of literature you'd read in, and whether it's, there's all kinds of Western canons now. It's not sure. just Herbert Adler um, and Hutchins canon. There's, you know, you could look at uh, uh, George Eliot put together the Harvard classics. Which, yes. Which yeah. I think is a phenomenal, I, I had not read all those and uh, I've been trying to read through the Harvard classics. Uh, very little overlap surprisingly with the great books, but there's all mm -hmm. kinds of, uh, of these and I think of in some ways intentionally, right. But the same, it's the, the literature that has formed and shaped uh, Western Civ, right? Uh, right. In both cases, I would say. And that plus the Bible is already right. a phenomenal education that anyone can get. And most of that stuff you can get online for free now. Correct. But public yes. libraries still actually exist. They don't exist yeah. in churches because now churches have bookstores and instead of resources yeah. for members for free, which shame mm -hmm. on churches. But at least there are still public libraries that are, that, that are still available, uh, even though they're books are becoming fewer and fewer in exchange for yeah, computers. more computers and yeah. iPads. And, yeah. It's, it's crazy society. It's like, let's not learn anymore. That's what I'm saying. And so, yeah. So even if you send your kid to a public school, uh, you know, by choice or of necessity, there is an education that I think the church and the home still need to provide at least to Christians to be able to navigate this culture. And I think that's the challenge, right? Because the reality is, and I think classical education gets a good, um, a good hold of this. It understands this. Education is formative. That's not optional. It's formative. So what education is being given? And that's my hesitation with public school. Now somebody may say, but you teach at a public college. Yeah, by the time they get to me, most of that work's already been done. Right, so, but, but so, pause so, there. Pause yeah. there. Thank God for a Christian working in <laughs> right. higher education at a public. <laughs> right. Quit, yeah. Quit, quit yeah. going to seminary and getting jobs like <laughs> I have. Number one, there's not any. So right. don't. Right. So quit trying. But dude, sure. go get jobs like he has. Go right. go get into science and right. math and, and yeah, and absolutely. And, and, and the humanities, but not his job. Uh, right. You know, don't compete with <laughs> Yell here. Uh, no, but uh, absolutely. And and yeah. I mean, how else? Um, can we have a voice in the marketplace, right? right. And, and so, um, but yeah, my point is, if, if you're going to send your kid off for six to seven hours a day, um, in which there is zero integration between faith and the rest of life, how, are, how, how, how do we avoid, and it can be done, but it's just a lot more difficult, how do we avoid the thought that these two things are actually separate, that they're compartmentalized? And so God doesn't have anything to say about math. God doesn't have anything to say about science. God doesn't have anything to say about, you know, grammar or whatever. Like, and, and so that, that's my goal. That's why I want to do homeschooling. 
and as you said earlier, not all Christian education is created equal um, because sometimes people confuse integration with contact, right? So it's like math. Oh, well, you know, Noah's Ark, it gives us measurements in scripture about Noah's Ark. You see, they use numbers, we use numbers. <laughs> no, like, that's not what I mean. We want to be really thoughtful in the way that we integrate these things. And so um, it makes me feel good when my son finds it odd that someone could sit in class and not learn about God. That's a strange thing. Um you know, as he grows, as he continues to learn, he'll find out there's a lot of people who do that um, and and will navigate those conversations. But it's this integration that like, no, I don't want him taking anything for granted. Um, he, he needs to realize the very foundation uh, that makes knowledge and observation and all of these things even possible uh, starts with the creator. And so, yeah. Yeah, I really think that's a very good point because sometimes Christians just want, like you said, look, numbers in the Bible, math right. is numbers. Let's <laughs> right. find a proof text to put over right. our math exactly. problems at exactly. the top of the page. Yeah. And that's all of a sudden, that's not right. Christian. That's right. that's uh, Bible appropriation, right? right? <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's not, it's not yes. teaching kids that because Jesus is Lord and God created the heavens and the earth that math works. That's right. You know, that's, that's right. the deeper thing that you've got to yes. go for. Right. And I, I do think that the uh, the Western canon helps s cement that in, so you incorporate the readings in with the basic curriculums. You know, it at least um, really allows you to wrestle with those questions. I mean, we we have to keep in mind that the especially the great books of the Western world, it's a diverse group. Mm -hmm. uh, there's pre-Christian authors. Uh, there's some pretty bad. Uh, you know, teachings within those texts. Sure, you got Hume, um, you got Marx, right, you got Darwin. Got, you got right, all, yeah. so you've got, you've got all kinds of stuff, but I think important, right? Absolutely. And I think that's, that's my point, um, you know, and it was interesting. I, I caught a post on Twitter that somebody posted just, just this morning, and I knew I would bring it up in my conversation with you today. It was basically this person said, you know, now that I have my kids at home because they're doing the online thing, because of the pandemic. She's like, I'm realizing the hours that go into schooling. She's like, how can we not want more for our public education? And I'm thinking, why is that our first thought? Why is our first thought not, man, I, cause she even used the terminology, we're giving our kids over for long hours every day. And I'm thinking, yeah, like why is our first thought not, why am I giving my kids over? for right. six hours a day. Um, and how significant are these six hours in my child's life, right? So um, I, I'm fortunate, I live in a state, I live in Florida, and we have, we have a decent program here where based on income, um, you can have vouchers and you can actually enroll your child in a Christian private school um, and the money that would typically go you know, towards the public school can be used towards that private school uh, education. So there are increasing opportunities, at least in my state, and this is a state to state thing, um, that, that, that allow people more options. I also, you mentioned how many people have been motivated. I know you were homeschooling before this whole COVID thing. My wife and I were already homeschooling and had already decided to homeschool before COVID. But it does, it is interesting to me that when you have the right motivation, how you find a way to do it. Um, people who would have maybe a year ago, two years ago said, it's just not possible for us. It's just not something we can do. Now all of a sudden your kid has to wear a mask for seven hours and that was enough motivation to find a way. Yeah. Um, I wanna encourage that person and say, the mask is not the worst thing that's that <laughs> yeah, likely going exactly. on, you know? Exactly. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because um, one of the things that we discovered, and of course we were homeschooling um, junior high, now high school. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if it's different at a younger age, but I don't think it would be that in three to four hours, you can have everything 
done and better because it's 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 more focused on just your your children you know they're not dealing with 20 people in a classroom yeah and so and and, and so even our kids were in private school you know it's eight to three or eight to three or whatever you know but all, all basic everything foundational to an education can be done in under four hours uh That's right. which which yeah for us it's it's two hours tops yeah. and 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 it's not that we're holding anything back we do we do everything we do bible we do history we do handwriting we do math we do, we do it all and it's it's right around two hours for us right. I mean, he's five you know yeah. so yeah. He's five. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and so when we say three or four hours, we're, we're talking about a signed shut up, sit down and read. Right. You know, and, and we're going to ask you questions when you're done. Sure. So I mean, yeah. at high school, a lot of it's um, uh, based on the curriculum. They'll read the materials together, but then right. sometimes you just got to read on your own or you got to yes. study for the exam yeah. or, or something like right. that. Um, which is, that's the hidden secret why, uh, on the one hand, I, um, one aspect of this, when, when even single parents say that, well, it's just not feasible. But if you're only working one job, it actually is, if you would rather teach your kids than have Netflix. Right. But part of what public school system is for, is for long hours on a bus to be long hours in a concrete hellhole you know a lot of these schools uh with just drab lighting and and concrete walls concrete you know or tile ceiling and concrete floors you know or or ugly tile floors you know it's warehousing you know a significant portion of our a population of this nation for nine hours a day right. you know or ten yeah. hours, depending on i mean i remember i was on a bus for an hour and a half both ways, right you right know. Yeah. Um, until we were able to drive and that cut it down to 20 minutes. But um, yeah, so we're, it, that's the issue that I think uh, that parents have is, well, even if I did homeschool, where do I put my kids? Right. And I made a post on Facebook a couple years ago that caused all kinds of chaos. Because I had this idea that I think the church should be providing, if not private education, then substantial co-oping sure. for its members. Right. And we should totally get all our kids out of public schools. And I think the churches should pay for that. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I mean, if they're going to pay for all kinds of things that they pay for. And, and, and I got all kinds of flack for that. But I actually think it's doable um, I, I, I really do. Um, I think that churches have plenty of people that either could be paid, uh, instead of churches spending money on dumb stuff or would even be happy to volunteer. Right. Um, I was not very popular at a lot of churches that I was a member at that had daycares. I was like, okay, you're profit profiting off of, <laughs> right. off of sure. parents who have yeah. to work, even both parents working, you know, right. uh, to, to pay for bills and you want to profit off of their, uh, you know, sure. their misfortune of not being able to stay at home. <laughs> That's there's just something wrong with that. Right. Uh, we should be happy to take their kids without, making them put out of money but anyway i'm gonna get all i'm gonna get letters and yells for that because daycare directors all across trinity radio's audience are going to be what do you mean free sure uh well we do vacation bible school for free right you right know? and and i think that's the thing is is it is it something that we have come to the point that we realize the importance yeah. um i see a lot of concern I see a lot of uh, back and forth on social media about everything that's wrong with our society today. Yeah. Um, if, if you are really concerned, I guarantee you that the education of our children within the church will make a much bigger impact than however you vote in November. I, yes. I, I, I guarantee it. Um, but oh, it, and who you vote? Yeah, and who's on your 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 uh, 
who goes to the the uh, the PTA meetings and the school school councils and your city council? All of that's infinitely more important than who's president, by the right. way. Right. Yes. People just don't realize Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Ninety percent of what yeah. you hate about whatever government, it's because of your local people. and local government and schools, public schools yeah. are tied. Right. So I mean, if your kids are in public schools it's important for you to show up to those meetings and, and, and participate. And, and so, um, but and get yeah, on school boards, right. You know? But I, I think, and I'll say this, I think as educators, mm-hmm. um, I agree with you. I think there's a way forward. Um, the thing is most schools already have classrooms, right? Cause they have children's ministry. And so they tend to have certain rooms already in place. A lot of the resources that would be needed um, should be in place. Um, And I think a lot of us, and there are lots, um, should be willing to do what we can as well to try and and help accomplish that. So uh, I am by no means kind of the model here. I'm still trying to figure it out myself, but I'll just give you one example of something that I've uh, attempted to do. The last three years, I have taught at least one course for middle high school virtually. So via zoom or Google hangouts or whatever for free. Um, I've taught logic. I've taught Spanish. Um, I'm teaching some students through uh, the Chronicles of Narnia right now. Um, And yeah, did you hear not, not we're reading it together. No, he said teaching through Yeah, as if there's, Remember, there's something to be learned from right. reading that book. Not, right. not oh, this is good fantasy novel. No, right. you're Correct. teaching it. Yeah, okay. teaching through it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and we've had great conversations. Um, and the age ranges there are 12 to 16. So, um, again, that's not the answer. But can we find more ways of saying, parents, if you make the effort and we know it comes at a cost to you, right? My wife and I know the cost. We know the cost of not having two incomes, yeah. right? We, we, we've had to sacrifice for, for not having two incomes. Um, so we know that. Parents, if, you're, if you can make the, the sacrifice. Churches, if you can make the sacrifice. That's, yeah. We, the educators, right, would also be willing to, to, to put some skin in the game. You know, we, we want to we want to help too, um, and and use our gifts to bless the church. So yeah, the and the and the thing is, I think a lot of parents would be on board. It's getting the churches to. It is hard. The, it's difficult. Yeah. The, the corporate responsibility, but and but you know, I've seen churches that. Here's what we're talking about, though. Most churches in America, for example, let's just use our context. In America, most churches have seventy-five or fewer. There's yeah. going to be, if they have kids at all, they're all going to be at a young age. Right, right. I've never seen anyone not want to volunteer. People, the old joke was, no one wants to teach the third and fourth grade boys class. Who's no one? I've always had people <laughs> like that. Right. You know? right, right, sure. And, and, and by the way, if you are in one of those rare churches where no one wants to be around the kids, which is weird, the secret no you don't want to teach high school you want to teach them when they're younger high school right. kids are not the oh, i want to be able because they're going to be open-minded and they're going to be right. more intellectually stimulated forget it yeah. <laughs> no they're going to be playing on their phones you know well uh, that's the thing we keep and it's interesting because i think the apologetics community has kind of gotten this it was like oh people are losing their faith in college by the way you know i think you know this about me but for those who don't like I was one of those. I had a sophomore year of college, had a crisis of faith, had a biology professor that denied the historical Jesus. All I knew was that the smartest man I'd ever met, this professor, um, said everything I believed was hocus pocus and I had zero answers for the objections he was raising. So, so I, I, I know that. I lived that. That's not just an, an anecdote. That's not just something to scare moms to sell curriculum. Like that is my experience. Um, so we think, oh, we need to help the college students. And then it's like, oh, well, no, we need to get them in high school because this is really when it starts. And then Josh McDowell has, has moved his ministry back to middle schoolers. And now we're realizing it starts from day one. 
It right. starts from day one. And, and so all of our education, which is my point, education's not neutral. And, and so um, we need to be doing the hard work of, of connecting these dots for our kids, helping them learn to connect the dots um, because we're not always going to be able to do that for them. Yeah. Um, not being afraid of, of the questions um, and, and trusting that a fully, uh, a, a, a holistic educational approach is going to bear much more fruit than just having your high school senior take an apologetics class before they go to college. That's right. Um, even if my son never takes an apologetics course, I am persuaded that if we're able to continue to do education the way we're doing it, he won't need one um, because wow. the questions will have been discussed, the answers and, and, and the wrestling with those ideas would have already happened. Um, I mean, he's, he's five and God bless him. He puts up with his dad who's reading the Chronicles of Narnia to him right now. And um, we've talked about the problem of evil. We've talked about um, the, you know, the virtues of courage and honesty and um, these things that come up. Uh, he even of his own accord, the other day we were reading a uh, silver chair, I think it was. And he's like, you know, Papa, Aslan sounds a lot like God. Right. And so he's making those connections himself. And then we can talk about how is he like God? How is he not like God? And we can have those discussions. So we're doing theology. We're doing apologetics. We're doing, you know, and, and it's not just about me trying to train him with these particular answers in hopes that he doesn't lose his faith. I want him to have a fully orbed, really robust view and theology of the world that we live in. Yeah, but 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 Miguel, not everyone is as awesome as you. So how does how does the retired guy who's sitting around on his porch saying, ah, "I want to help some kids," right? How does how does he get involved in this? Yeah, uh, because I think I think I agree with you that it starts from early age. So we, maybe we need to for churches that still bother with Sunday school need right. to rethink about what Sunday school is about, what you're doing. That's a fair point. With your time there is it just point. coloring, right? You know, right. Noah's Ark and rainbows and yeah. leaving out the drowned people outside of the ark. Right. You know, I mean, right. what are you what are you doing with your time there? And 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 so, but I I know that a lot of people, um, at, at least in the kinds of churches back home in Arkansas where you have good folk, um. But they're not well. They would they would admit that they're not well learned. Sure. They they would have liked to have been taught sure. better, but they just but they but they they are aware enough that this is a problem because they're seeing kids burn down cities, and they're like not. I don't want the kids in my church kids choir to be those people one day. Right. So so how did they? get their head around this and say, okay, what can I be doing and what should I be doing to better myself so that I can teach them? Yeah, no. And, and I think, I think that's a fair point. And, and again, we, we each have a context within which we are working. Um, so I think two things. Um, one, what I would say is we should be as disciples of Jesus. We should be lifelong learners, right? I want to learn more about Jesus. I want to learn more about God and the world he has made till I die. Like we should be learning. Uh, we should be learning believers until we die. So, so I think maybe we need to beef up a little bit our personal enrichment, right? Our, our personal education. But the other thing is do not be afraid and I think that hopefully this, this gives some freedom to some parents that are maybe on, on the fence or someone who's willing to, you know, maybe a grandparent that's weighing, should I, should I homeschool my grandchild? Um, it can definitely be a journey in which you learn together. And now you are this person who is there to guide them and help them um, as they are learning. You don't have to have all the answers. You can put together pretty solid curriculum by gathering up free resources online. Like it, it does not have to cost you a ton. Yes, there are some awesome curriculum out there that are expensive. And, and if you can do that, great. But you can put together free resources and, 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 and as they get older, finding ways in which you can maybe supplement, right? Like 
all joking aside, like if, if my kid can learn introduction to new Testament from Jonathan Pritchett, like that's better than what he would learn, you know, when he goes off to college uh, or just as good at least. And so, um, how better. how do we let's find say let's say better okay if it's me, <laughs> if it's me let's say better <laughs> so, so so what i'm saying is we oh, can man. we can rely on these resources that that god gives us within our community but that also means community we need yeah. to be looking for ways we can step in and 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 help you know um i'll be honest and and maybe this is something my wife and i even have to explore but like i think about the work we do with our five-year-old I'm not sure that it would be terribly difficult to add another five-year-old sitting next to him and help them through schooling. You know what I mean? Like it, it wouldn't add a ton of work to our day. Yeah. Um, so. see, but different states have different laws. Like you had mentioned the grandparent who may be interested in homeschooling. Right. Well, in the state of Indiana, they can't. It's got to be one of the, it has to be one of the parents that does, I think it's, two thirds or 75% of the education. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So there's all kind different States put up all yeah. these kind of roadblocks yeah. to, to make it more yeah. difficult. And I know that there are, there are, you know, advocates out there trying to change all these laws yeah. and say, Hey, if we can just better educate these yeah. kids, does it matter if it's grandma or right. uncle Timmy <laughs> right. Right. Or, or even the yeah. pastor at the church doing it every yeah. day, right. you know, because these laws can get insane in various States. Um, and, and that's so, definitely something that has to be taken into account. Um, I live in Florida and I, I think that their laws are very loose. Surprisingly, the homeschooling organizations that look at these kinds of things actually ranks Florida as like moderate. So the ones that are really loose, I, I, I mean, that means you must like hardly have to check in at all. <laughs> right. Um, basically all we need to do is provide a portfolio to a certified teacher and they just sign off at it, on it at the end of the year. Um, the state itself never checks up on what we are teaching them mm. or anything like that. So, so yes, we have it good in Florida. I was not aware of that. And yes, like you yeah. said, all states are going to have different laws. I think we need to push, um, being the conservative that I am and, and kind of the small government guy that I am, I, you know, I think the Department of Education should just be shut down. But hey man. If, if we are going to have one, I think we should work toward, okay, there's a certain amount of money allotted at the federal level and at the state level for every student that goes to a public school. Give the parents the choice of where that money is going and where their kids go into school. Um, and, and, and keep in mind, this is tax dollars. So it's not like, it's not like it's the government's gift to us. This is money they've already taken from us and they are allocating it. Give us the choice of how we use that money and where we put our children uh, into school. And I think what we would see is the kind of competition in charter schools, in Christian schools, um, because now you're giving parents the resources to give their kids the best education possible. Yeah. But I think Christian education is possible. To, even if you have a kid in public school, you can get the canon of books that we're talking about. Absolutely. And you can actually, I mean, even, uh, you know, you, you can get stuff for free so you can supplement your child, but it's going to take parents getting involved. That's right. And That's right. in the age of Netflix and sometimes, you know, long hours with long commutes, um, parents, you know, they're, at, they're, they're tired. They get their, their children from daycare and they go home and they just want to veg or whatever because they've had a long day too. But at some point, trust me, when you, when you get teenagers, they'll ignore you plenty. So <laughs> while they're young, right. spend as much right. time as you can indoctrinating, yeah. there's that word again, indoctrinating sure. them the right way, right. no matter how tired you are, or double up on Saturdays after you're refreshed for a few hours. But there is actually yeah. time to do this. Uh, but I do think the churches need to get involved. Uh, and I want to see Christian education in the church feather out to the home. I mean, you know, people say, well, education, church, yes, but the church uh, can direct that uh, and be a powerful resource. Um, the Isn't that church, what children's ministries say anyway? Like their mission statement is always to partner with the parent in helping them to, 
this is just one additional way in doing that. Right. And, 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 and actually getting some mileage out of your children's right. ministry. Right. But I want to get my, I always rebuke pastors that if your kid, if your church is large enough to have a children's ministry, praise God. But if they don't know that you're the senior pastor and don't know your name, yeah. you're the worst. You need to resign right. quit your job. You're a failure. <laughs> uh, you don't hire the, the, the children's minister. So you don't have to deal with, right. You don't know my kids' names. You're not my pastor period. Sure. Yeah. You know, you better know their names and, and they better know who you are. Right. Um, and that doesn't happen a lot either. So, I mean, we, uh, and, and that happens in bigger churches and, and smaller churches where it's right. shove the kids off with what, whoever is the youngest mom of children, give her right. all the kids that show up, which is typically the three or four other grandkids. And, and <laughs> you know, and, and, and that has been my wife. As right. Children, sure. De facto yeah. unpaid children's right. minister at many churches that we've gone to small, you know, I mean, so, uh, you know, and that almost happened to you, my friend, we were talking yes. about that off, but that that's, yes. that's how you would have ended up right. if you would have right. stayed where you were. Yeah. Anyway. So that's what, so this is what we're dealing with. So it's a call to Christian education, to the churches and to Christian parents. That's right. And I, yeah. I want to go back real quick to something that you said, because I think it's really important to realize um, so I think in a, in a kind of a, it doesn't even have to be an ideal situation, right? I think, it, I think educating our children from home is much more possible than people realize. So I would encourage anyone who's kind of wrestling with that, explore those possibilities because there are many possibilities. But the second thing to realize, and I think this was something that it was kind of a light bulb that went off for me in my undergrad. I remember I went to a secular college and I remember thinking to myself after I had the crisis of faith, I kind of dove into apologetics and philosophy and started exploring these things. I was like, man, I feel like as a Christian student who actually cares about the academic side of it, I have to do more work than the average student because I have to learn everything that I'm being taught in class. And then I need to weigh everything that I'm being taught in class your five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old is not equipped to do that. And so if they are going to public school, that's where you're going to have to do some of that. You're going to have to help them do some of that heavy lifting of this is what they learned in class. How do we weigh what they learned in class? Mm. Are you able to kind of connect those dots for them? And if they are in no position to weigh that themselves, they need to find a church with a pastor who is teaching them properly. Absolutely. Because a lot of, wherever we can complain about failures in, in whether it's public education or public higher education right. or just secular private education, wherever your kids are going to university, whatever we wanted to cry about what they're learning there, if we're not countering that in the church, then you can't complain about it because you're not doing your job as a pastor. Right. And that's going to go deeper than whatever message you cooked up just on a Sunday morning sermon that may or may not be applicable to what right. they're learning. Because, because if the pastor's not engaging science from a biblical worldview or what does God have to say about math um, or logic, you know, if your sermon is, even if it's a biblically sound sermon, I'm not talking about those feel good health and wealth type, you right. know, don't, or, or the don't worry, be happy, or right. here's five t tips for financial <laughs> success. Or, right, but right. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about a good solid sound yes. biblical sermon, yeah. uh, you know, that's good old time religion, but it's not the now time religion that we need. That's right. It lacks contextualization. Right. Even if it is a good sermon, it, you're, you're not bridging the context. And, and I think you're right. And, and, and I think that um, here's the thing. I'll, I'll, I'll mention this for, for anyone who's watching and listening at this point, because oftentimes I think colleges, like you said, you know, we, we, we can oppose some of the things that get taught in these colleges and all of that. Like I said, the, the overwhelming majority of students that I teach are first and second year college students. And I can tell you that as, and I don't have scientific like data, but I'm just telling you as it comes up in class, I can tell you that I have found that the overwhelming majority of my students would say they believe in God. Now we understand that can be very vague and mean all kinds of things. Hmm. When most of them declare a particular religion, they mostly declare Christianity. And the overwhelming majority of my students, now that we've already said they are theists, 
and most of those are Christians, believe that if there's a difference of opinion, we cannot know for sure. Just a difference of opinion means... A difference of opinion opinion. rules out the possibility of knowing for sure. Wow. Um, And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, these are questions that are posed to them. And, and, and they believe, uh, well, you know, so we've all heard this. If you're in apologetic circles, right? Um, is torturing babies for fun wrong, right? My students at this point in time will tell you, the majority of them, not all, but the, the overwhelming majority will say, I would never do it. But there may be people out there who think it's okay. And so even though I think it's wrong, they think it's not wrong. And so we can't really say that one's wrong or one's right. I would say I wouldn't do it. They would say that it's okay and that kind of thing. So that's where we're left with. That's, that's where we're left with. And it's getting applied in more areas than just ethics. And so, um, yeah, if, if, every, if we're just perception or opinion all the way down, I mean, that kind of skepticism leaves us no room for for anything i mean well so, so, well anything but chaos it's right. going to be a chaotic right. world that's right and that's and right. yeah and so that that and that's antithetical to christianity that's right you know yeah jesus and, is, and again we're assuming most of these students would identify as christians and have at least be, in, in some sense right yeah um, have likely been in church at some point in time. And this isn't just a, right. I mean, we all know people who go to church and, and kind of aren't listening, aren't. So it's not just always blaming the church, but we do see the data coming out over and over again um, that there certainly seems to be a disconnect in uh, the way that we're going about discipling um, and, and people in the way that they try and deal with everyday life. All right. So to wrap up the conversation, I want I, I want to get what is your bottom line solution to the problem? Where to begin, and what do you see as a good goal? Where, where to start, and where, what's a good at least first goal? Sure. So I would say um, very first goal: understanding that we live in a really complex world, and and we have a a kind of system that's already in place, right? The if the pandemic has, has exposed that not only do we pe- depend on the schools to educate our children, we depend on them as babysitters, right? It, it's, it's, been, it's been shown that we, we depend on them on the daily for much more than just educating our children. Um, so I would say the number one goal is for uh, parents to get involved in their child's education, regardless of the situation, right? So whether it's public school, private school, homeschool, get involved and begin meaningful dialogue. And I think the best way to do this is through good literature. Have meaningful dialogue with your children. Uh, My five-year-old has blown me away in the questions he asks, in the way that he tries to wrestle with things. Um, He's even asking fundamental questions about the nature of things, not using that vocabulary. But the other day, you know, he approached me and said, Papa, how, how is it that you know, the heavens and earth are the first thing that God made. Wouldn't he have had to make words first if he's going to speak Hmm. things into existence? This is my five-year-old. So he's trying to wrestle with the nature of things and what is it that God made first and are words the same kind of thing as matter, you know? And and so we're wrestling through those, um, you know, things. It's not, you know... He, I don't think he's in any way, you know, an exception. Um, I, I don't think I'm an exception as a parent. Um, I think our kids are capable of wrestling through these things. And literature is a beautiful way of getting them to start thinking through these, these issues and just have dialogue, have meaningful dialogue with our kids. If we can do that, we can begin to curb some of the influences uh, of of secular education, um, and we can start to make private school and homeschooling education much more meaningful. Um, And and so that would be step one for me. Um, And it's the parent. Uh, I've heard you talk about 
kind of the idea behind the churches. I love that idea. I'm behind that idea. But step one would still be the parent. And this is something you can do. And I get being tired. I get coming home and just needing to veg. But I think, um, I think there's a lot uh, on the line right now. I do too. That's why I spend, you know, I'm, I'm at a seminary, but I spend a lot of my time. <laughs> How do we get these kids? You know, maybe it's self-serving. Maybe it's because I want them to grow up to want to come to a seminary. To be seminarians. Absolutely. Right, yeah, That's yeah, awesome. No, no it's because, it, <laughs> you know, what, what's really behind it though, um, I say that facetiously, but maybe a sure. little bit of that, maybe a little bit of that. <laughs> but what's really behind it is that my kids and grandkids have to navigate this world. That's right. And this world is getting, I, I'm, every generation says this, but I'm at that age where I can say it now. It's getting worse than it was before, right? <laughs> in some yeah. ways it's better, but in a lot of ways it's worse. And, uh, you know, as far as from a worldview standpoint, it's way worse than yeah. it was just 20, 25 years ago. The things people are saying now, academics even, our colleagues are right. stupid. Uh, there's no other word for it. It's just, it, it's. Well, yeah. I mean, when, when you, when you, uh, so to just mention the college, right? When you are paying thousands of dollars to go to a college that will essentially tell you that you can't know anything for sure, right? Um, what are we doing here? Yeah. I mean, what are we doing? So I'm encouraged. Um, I, and coming across more and more colleagues that have similar positions to mine. Uh, we want to honor our institutions. We want to, you know, um, do our job and do it well. And I think that's the, I think that that's one of the things that has been misunderstood is that um, it automatically means you can't. And, and I'm finding more and more who I think we're being able to make meaningful um contributions yeah i think campuses. i think there's going to be somebody uh, you're going to find if you say you're you're teaching in the humanities right and you're going to end up discovering that there's a science someone in the science department that that's teaches right physics and then there's going to be an economist professor or economics right. professor <laughs> right uh and, and maybe an accounting yeah. and y'all are going to sit around one day and say some of the people we w work with are buying into this completely right. dumb stuff and you're going to start seeing some pushback sure. i'm hoping for that if more and more christians would be more like you and less like me i think we'd be do no if you're because all i think we absolutely need both I, I honestly this has to be a team effort the reality I is I you have that. an audience that i don't right yeah and so but you have an audience that i want because right. your audience has lost people and i want right. to be evangelizing right. them sure. but they're not even going to hear me unless you right. soften the ground you Correct. see what i'm yeah. saying because yeah. our our institutions are overrun with yeah. crazy people. And I'm not talking about just liberal versus conservative. No, political. no, no, no. I'm We're talking, talking about, about yes. worldview yes. chaos. Yeah. I don't care if they're a Democrat or a Republican. Right. I know no. Republicans. We're talking are about just knowledge here. Right. Just, yes. How do we know things? <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's start yeah. at the beginning. That's right. And, yeah. and and why do you think we can't know things? Exactly. And why does two plus two not equal four right. anymore? You know, we're trying to figure this stuff out now in college. So, you know, right. that's, that's why right. I'm saying we need to. Yeah. And, and so my goal is the same as yours. In the home, Christian parents, if you can't do um, Christian home education and your church is not helping much. Right. Uh, you know, it starts with you countering the filth and the nonsense that's coming into that's your right. kids' brains in yeah. elementary school and beyond, certainly right. high school. Yeah. Uh, but then I step and say, churches, wake up to the problem of your kids and don't just listen to apologists like me who says, we need more apologetics. In the it's way past, apo and, and it's, it's way past systematic theology and we'll just teach sound doctrine. Right. No, it's world. It's basic worldview yes. stuff. You've got That's to right. do a fully orbed worldview That's teaching right. that incorporates theology and philosophy and apologetics and all of that and, and, and biblical uh, knowing the biblical narrative, you know, uh, it's all of it. And that's, so my call is really to the church. Uh, if you gave the call to the parents, I'm going to give the call to the church to wake up to this situation. Don't ship your kids off into a Sunday school class followed by a children's ministry class that does nothing to filter and, you know, reinforce the values of the church and filter out five days. Um, what? Almost 40 plus hours that they've gotten that stands 
much of which at least stands in direct opposition of what you're learning at your home and what you're learning in your church. Wake yeah, up to the problem. And I want to add one more thing, and I hope this isn't too self-serving, but 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 I I do think it's important. I'm good with conferences, right? We went to Biola. Biola puts on amazing conferences all over the country. And that's great. And and I'm I'm not opposed to them. I think they're important. I think they're good. But if a local church is aware of Jonathan Pritchett and Braxton Hunter, if two or three local churches are aware and can lean on you as resources, where there's these relationships developed that, hey, we have academics in our community, thoughtful Christians in our community. How much more of a resource, how much more help can we bring to the local church than the church that is focusing on bringing the Biola people from California who have to fly out the next day? Yeah. Um, and even and we we even run the risk now because we have so much access to these apologists, right? And and the, as far as online and things like that, and I think that's awesome. I'm not saying do less of any of that. I'm saying let's do more of this thing over here, where we have really thoughtful Christians. Apologetics degrees have been out for a while now. Yeah. A number of people have them. Yes. Um let us get to work in the local churches. Um, and, and I think churches, it's not just apologists be available. It's local churches be aware that there are these people likely in your community um, that are dying for opportunities to serve yeah. your church. They, so. I, I speak to them all the time, you know, yeah. uh, some of our graduating class went on to teach at HBU and people like you and I went on to teach at other places. Right. Most of them, aren't doing anything that's right that's right and they would and love thoughtful people yeah thoughtful awesome people, people. yes almost yes. everyone i met at biola yeah. i liked there was a couple people eh, but <laughs> but almost everyone that i met i thought that's was right. really good yeah. people that wanted to do good and serve the lord in ministry that's right and they're not finding it um and and you know and one of the things that that i always and here i am on youtube with the youtube channel. this is this, this is just a thing that i do a couple hours a week but uh you know the the thing that i railed against and still rail against is don't think for for our friends and colleagues in, in apologetics don't think that because you have started a online ministry youtube channel that you've done something for the church you've done nothing you've talked in a camera and it's ultimately self-serving and entertainment. And if you're not entertaining people, then they're not even watching. So, <laughs> right. you know, so no yeah. local church, you know, and I remember, um, it's like a long time ago. Now I would print up flyers. Now you can even make them way better than I could, back. but you make up flyers and you, you fold them, three ways to look like a brochure and you, you put what you, who you are and what your credentials are and what you could talk about and you take them to churches and you force your way in the doors and eventually it's going to catch on. And eventually someone's going to give you the opportunity to speak on a Sunday night, yeah. you know, and then that could turn into to more uh, opportunities. And, and, and so many other get out there and do it, get off the yeah. internet and go serve. That's right. Them. That's right. I want to encourage more people especially those that, you know, are into apologetics, um, have apologetics degrees, your local libraries. Local libraries are always looking to offer more things to the community. Start a philosophy club at your local library. Have people gather together, have discussion. Um, you know, th there's a hundred different ways that we can a Great start books, reading. Educate people. Yeah. Exactly. A great books club. Um, I mean, yeah. whatever it is. Um, and not to get too far off, but I think all of this is related because we're, we're saying, okay, how do we educate people in a society that has largely given up on, on, on any hope of knowing? So, yes. yeah. And, and educating adults so that they can become better educators. That's of, right. 
of the kids. Yeah, absolutely. The church needs to take this serious. Miguel, thank you so much for having this dialogue. Uh, we need to have more conversations like this and in, in, in everywhere because we, you know, we're college and seminary professors, you know, and, and I know they call you an instructor. You're still a professor. You're a professor in my book. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you the title. Of your That's college right. Mode. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but academic types like us sure. here, here we are, we see education from the top from our ivory towers and ivory towers are awesome. We see our, for the ivory tower all the way down, right? Because we can see when, when they're, you know, 18 to 50, some of my students, you know, what did we, we could tell what they got before they got here by what they're giving us now. So right. we know what education is doing to people. And even with adult learners, two generations in, three generations in the, what public education in this country has done. And when we find out, we can all, you know, and it's no surprise when we find out that certain people have private education or homeschooling backgrounds or whatever, right. they are better. And every study in the world, we did this on Trinity Radio. Yes, every, you did. Not, and, I, and I would recommend yeah. anyone to, to listen to that episode. Yeah. I thought it was helpful in kind of navigating some of those things. But no, I think you're right. We need to have these ongoing conversations but I also appreciated the emphasis here is, hey, what can we do? What can we yeah. do? Let, let's get moving. Um, because, yeah, there, there is always the, you know, our culture is going to hell in a handbasket. And it's like, yeah, okay, fine. But I, I, I'll be honest, in some ways, I'm really encouraged. In some yeah. ways, I'm really encouraged. If, so. if. Well, I don't like Antifa, so I'm going to vote Trump 2020. Woo! If that's your, I'm going to take a stand. Right. You have failed. <laughs> right. Your that's children, right. that's you have right. failed your that's church, right. you have failed yes. your children. Yes. It's yeah. way, well, that's it's, right. it, forget politics yeah. for a We're talking about bigger yeah. things. If not wearing a mask is going to be the hill that you die on, I think you've you've lost sight of, of the Right, things. and you've you've yeah. conceded so much already, yeah. right, that it it's so that's little right. that you'll die for now. And I think the thing is, it's weird because I, I get it. And then people who are down and discouraged, I, I a hundred percent get it, but I almost see this opportunity of like, okay, but like truth will ultimately win out. Yeah. And so we're in a position culturally where the absurd is really being embraced right now. Mm -hmm. I don't think that can, I don't think that can continue for long before people, and this is why regardless of, conservative or liberal they're getting canceled i think people are going to eventually say this is crazy this, this can't keep going and and if we're already in position and we're already doing the things we're supposed to be doing locally in the community yes youtube is great do youtube but let's let's engage our local community let's be part of the local church um, I think it'll put us in, in a very strategic position. I, I agree. The world's not going to go back to whatever pretend, pick a, pick a decade that you think was better. Okay. Right. It's never going to go backwards. Correct. Correct. It's always going to evolve and change. That's right. It can always get worse. It can always get better. But the thing is, what do we want to have when it changes again, when the culture right. shifts, when it hits that tipping point that you're, you know, where people are fed up and had enough, That's right. they're going to, it's going to get replaced. Culture is going to change. It's going to be replaced with something that looks different than it does now because right now it looks different than it does even 20 years ago. Correct. So what do we have to offer? What's going what, what are we going to offer instead? If you tear it, even they let's say it's all gets torn down or some of it gets torn down. It's just a minor cultural shift, whatever it is, what is going to be there waiting after people get fed up? Because, because when that happens, it'll be yeah. too late, right? right. It, if we're not already in place, it'll be too late at that point. Yeah. So we have to have something there that's more attractive to culture right. to go to. So Miguel, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Any thank final, you for having me. Uh, final, where you are once again, a couple more plugs. Uh, you got to so, get better at it. That's fine. You can, <laughs> you can, you can find my information at Miguel Benitez Jr. or Jr. So Miguel Benitez Jr. dot com, um, and then also my YouTube channel is just Miguel Benitez Jr. If you search it, the channel will pop up. 
um, and you can find me there as well. That's very Braxton Hunter of you because you can find Braxton Hunter at BraxtonHunter.com. And there you go. The name of my YouTube channel, is, my main YouTube is Braxton Hunter. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's probably something to this. Name it after yourself, you know? Uh, yeah. People are going to think that I am Braxton Hunter one day. That'll be fine. Uh, because everyone likes him. But anyway, Miguel, thanks so much. I've had a blast. I hope you come back and we talk about other stuff. So uh, I've enjoyed it. And yeah, yeah, sure. Anytime. I look forward to it. All right. We'll see you all next time on Trinity Radio.